slacking. Come on through the open door. You gonna run through the open door? I'm gonna run. Do you really? Make some noise if you really believe it. Come on, you see, make some noise. Greetings to all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is Mazma Kenneth once again. And I want to appreciate the good Lord for the good opportunity he has given unto us to continue to do this wonderful work of the ministry. I also want to appreciate each and every one of you who are outstanding Berenians that are taking the initiative of cross-examining whatever that is being shared on our a number of different platforms out there we encourage you never to give up we encourage you to continue to search through the scriptures and examining and actually also testing every sort of spirit to know if it is of the lord we also want uh, to appreciate the good lord for the opportunity he has given unto us the privilege of knowing his word in a generation where this uh, deception is only increasing day by day as per the prophecy that was given by our Lord Jesus Christ that in the latter time there will actually be more deception and more false prophets arising. Now today we are considering something that is to do with the church as the pillar and the ground of truth. The church as the pillar and the ground of truth. Now this is something very important for us to consider since it's one of the things that we have in the writings that are to do with the apostolic warnings. Paul said to Timothy, a junior minister, but if I tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Now the house of God is none other than believers. We all know that in the Old Testament, God was residing in temples that were made by the hands of men. But as far as the New Testament is concerned, after the death and the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ, everything that was typifying, everything that was in form of the shadow, Jesus brought it to an end because he is the substance unto all the shadows were pointing unto. So upon the cross of Calvary in John 19.30, he said it is finished. That was the end of those uh, things to do with the, the sacrifices and so many other things that were in form of shadows. So one thing we need to understand in the New Testament, after the death and the resurrection, God has this decided to indwell all his children. That is why 1 Corinthians 3.16 says that our bodies have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same thing is repeated in the book of 1 Corinthians 6.19. So there are a number of outstanding evidences that show us that actually God has decided to indwell us. So individual believers are actually the dwelling place of of the Lord and what is more actually solid is that we as individual believers we make what we call the body of Christ so now when we come together we call or we make what we call the body of Christ and so something that Paul says to Timothy that needs to be understood here very carefully he says that if I take long know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God we ourselves, individual believers, we need to know how to behave ourselves. And when we come together as the body of Christ, the other thing that is also very important, we also need to know how we are supposed to conduct and regulate ourselves as the house of God, which is the church. That's the Greek word known as ekklesia, which means the called out ones. We that were once in darkness have been called into his marvelous light. Pastor Peter chapter 2 verses 9 to 10 is concerned. So it adds in to say, the pillar underground of truth. So that is where we are going to base a number of different things that we are going to discuss. What is something that has caught my attention is seeing this verse having uh, something that needs you and I also to consider. Why would God actually uh, allow Paul to use such statements like uh, the pillar 
underground of truth. Now the pillar is something that is very important as far as maintaining or giving stability to a building so that that building is able to stand any natural tendency to fall so that that building is able to stand all other storms. Now for the church itself the main things that come to us as storms they are none other than what we call false teachings and a number of different practices that are pagan in nature which we have allowed to infiltrate the church. So the young man is being told how he ought to make sure that him as a leader should know how to behave himself in the house of God. It comes back to you as an individual believer in Christ. Do you know how you're supposed to behave yourself? And when it comes to the body uh, of Christ, do we know how we are supposed to behave ourselves? Because one other thing as to why is that we ought to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God is because we are the pillar underground of truth. We are the pillar underground of truth. That is why if we are the pillar underground of truth, that means that we are supposed to uphold the truth, the doctrine in a world where we have no any person that can defend the truth. We know for sure that the people of the world, they have no interest in the defense of the gospel. That basically means it is the church to defend the gospel. It is the church to look out for any person that tries to contaminate, any person that tries to dilute which is already given unto us. He warned Paul as Paul was writing still to the Corinthians, he told them you happily put up with anything any person tells you in Second Corinthians 11.4. Even when they preach another Jesus, even when they preach another spirit, and even when they preach another gospel. So as the pillar of truth we are supposed to hold on to things we are supposed to remain consistent in what is already given unto us so that basically means caution has to be taken and uh, before Paul came to this point of uh, making uh, a number of these outstanding things he began in first Timothy if you see chapter 1 let us first go through first Timothy chapter 1 and see a number of uh, things that Paul came up with to warn this young man. When you look in First Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, he said, As I besought you to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So the church being the pillar and the ground of truth, on an individual basis, you should do not receive or accept anything that contradicts what is already written. We have already said and we are saying it again that the Bible is not an open canon. The Bible is a closed canon. That's why there are a number of teachings that do not allow you and I to add or subtract. And uh, examples to that is Deuteronomy 4, 2. Another thing is Deuteronomy 12, 32. Another thing is Proverbs 35 to 6 and Revelation 22, 18 to 19. All of those scriptures do not allow us to add or subtract what we commonly call the devil's algebra, which is subtracting from the word of God by adding to it and adding to the word of God by subtracting from it, which many people have done. So he told him, do not allow any person to teach any other thing. As if that was not enough. The same thing he repeated it in a, in a chapter 6 of the same book, verse 3. Telling still this young man, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to doctrine, that man is proud. So, if you are a part of the church, remember the letters are not written to the unbelievers. The letters are written to the believers. You who says that you are a believer in Christ, you are instructed not to actually teach anything otherwise 
to teach something that contradicts what we already have. We don't have more revelations other than what we have. Why? Jesus is the last speaking of God. Hebrews 1, 1 says that in the former times, God spoke to us through the fathers and the prophets and so many ways. But in these last days has he spoken unto us by his son. The same was repeated of what we know during the time when Jesus was still here in the flesh. Considering Matthew 17 verses 1 to verse 6, when he was on the mountain of transfiguration, there actually happened something. There actually appeared Moses and Elijah and they were talking with him. As they were talking with him, Jesus had carried three of his closest. That was actually James, uh, John and Peter. But Peter arose out of the sleep and then he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Wanting to equate Christ with Moses and Elijah, then the voice from nowhere just came out and said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen or hear him. The scripture does not say hear them, but hear him. So that is why we are saying Christ is the last speaking of God. And everything that is to do with the word of Christ, it is already given unto us within the writings of what we call the scripture. That is why in John chapter 14, uh, 23 says, Whoever loves me should keep my commandment. And the same thing Paul himself repeated by saying to the church of the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 6 by saying I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel we are not supposed to embrace another gospel other than the gospel that points upon what we call the death the burial and the resurrection this gospel is what has made salvation not to be based on human merits but based on the merit of Christ him who knew no sin was made sin that we might become the the righteousness of God. Now, since people are not adhering to some of those things, is why again Paul repeated still in First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 by saying, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor wherefore they affirm. So in the church of God, which is the pillar, which should sustain and preserve the doctrine that is already given unto us, which is the ground of truth, one thing here that is being told of us that there are people within us there are people among us who want who actually have a desire of being teachers of the law understanding neither what they say they are confident in what they are saying not knowing that they are wrong about what they are not saying that's why today we have had a number of teachings that are to do with legalism and many of the thing is actually with a number of different groups that also uh, claim to be calling on the name of Jesus Jesus, like the Church of Rome, which talks about salvation is actually by grace through actually other things to do with works, which actually Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 refutes. It says we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own self, lest any man should boast. So things to do with adding to the work of Christ should do not be done. Why? The church is the pillar and the ground of truth. That's why we should avoid a number of things that are to do with the legalistic teachings. Avoiding people that are known as tithe preachers. Avoiding people who are actually so much into sowing your seed. We, uh, yet the Bible tells us in Mark 4.14 that the seed is none other than the word of God. People who are trying to redefine the word of God by making it say what it doesn't say. We are supposed to avoid it since we are the pillar and the ground of truth. And what we have started with by saying is that the world has no interest to defend what was given unto us. It is us that belong to the Lord that should defend what has already been given unto us and that is why in many of the teachings of Christ he actually gave an example of people that are having what we call a house that is that is solid. A house that is solid is, is a house that is built on what we call the rock. And remember still he said in Matthew 16 that the church is built 
upon the rock and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The devil will do all that he knows how to do. But if we are only faithful and loyal to what is already in the scripture and we test everything that is being communicated to us, no one is going to take advantage of us. The challenge is us leaving what is already given then to look out for what we call extra biblical revelation and looking actually for visions and a number of other things. That is why we have a number of books today that have been written that are unbiblical, like Jesus calling of a lady known as Sarah Young, saying that what she had in the scriptures was, was not enough. So she needed God to speak to her in a more and clear way, as if saying that what we have in the scriptures is not enough. Now, if we are having people who are desiring to teach other things that we are told of not to continue. Is the reason as why Paul wants in, in First Timothy 1 and verses 18. It says, This charge I commit unto you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before or knew that you, that you by them might draw a good war. There is a war that we are supposed to carry on. That war should be actually the war of keeping what is already given to us. We call it the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith is upholding to the apostolic teaching, is upholding to what was given unto them. That is why Jude one three says that we should contend for what is already given unto to us. Why? Because within the body of Christ, there will come a number of different people who are saying, God has spoken to me, God has done this and that. All of those we should not embrace. And if any person tries to talk, that is why First John 4 1 says that, test all spirits, beloved, test all spirits to know if they are coming from the Lord. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we are being warned of actually becoming seeker friendly, but yet we are diluting the only message that can keep the church in, in a position that it's supposed to be in. So we are being told that we should not actually allow anything to come in that tries to antagonize. We don't know how long Paul was going to tarry, but one thing we know for sure that he made so very much clear to the young man that was very important. He told him that you need to know how you ought. To do what? To behave yourself. We are not supposed to have any intercourse. We are not supposed to have any relationship with anything that tries to undo what is already given unto us. Anything that is to do with a new doctrine. Anything that is to do with other teachings that are not actually in a obedience to what was already given. So we are supposed to honor and to preserve and to protect what has been given unto us, to correct all forms of errors within the body of Jesus Christ. Now, another thing that is also very important, still Paul talking in First Timothy 2, 5, because I want to go from chapter 1 to chapter 3, and then I show you. In First Timothy 2, 5, it says, For there is one good and one mediator between man and God, Christ Jesus. So what is also showing us that we as the pillar and a ground of truth, no any person should actually take up the place of Christ. Today I have heard of people talking about a number of things that are to do with uh, actually your money, your works. People are talking about things to do with visions. People are talking about to do with ministers. They have made them mediators. People who are actually carrying on uh, things to do with yoga. People are carrying on things that are to do with speaking with the dead. The Bible does not allow us to have another mediator other than Christ. If you seek for any other mediator other than Christ, that is bypassing Christ and you're creating a source that God does not acknowledge. There are a number of scriptures which show us us, that Christ indeed is the only mediator. If you only also consider Hebrews 9.15, it says the same thing, which is the same thing that we also see in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 to 7. It also says Jesus is the only mediator. The same is true in Hebrews 12.24. Jesus is the only mediator. So don't think and have your trust 
in having angelic visitations to receive messages, in actually speaking with a dead necromancer, which the Bible forbids us from doing, and actually things to do with a fourth dimension, where you are seated somewhere, you sit into some particular sitting posture so that you can connect with some things I hear with the spirit of the universe. The Bible does not allow us to do that. We are the pillar and the ground of truth. And everything that we do should be in actually in a, a principal support of the truth of the doctrine that was already given unto us in the scripture. Anything harsh that tries to intimidate anything in form of falsehood and error that tries to shake what is already given unto us, we are supposed to stand against it and say that is not for us to do what? To take in. Do not actually allow any form of design. Do not allow any form of impression that is of the system of the world to be allowed within the church. Why? Because we need to know how we, have, we are supposed to behave ourselves in the church or in the house of God, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. Very important things that were considered. And that is why before you go to 1 Timothy 2, 5, 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 to 4 says, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Part of knowing the knowledge of the truth is knowing that Christ is the only mediator. Our works cannot qualify us before God. Any person trusting in his own ability, the works are very good, but we don't do good works to be saved. We believers do good works because we are saved. But if you make the works to be the source, to be the foundation of your relationship with God, you have lost it. So the Bible says you shouldn't do that. The same is true in First Timothy, still where they are telling us that we should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In chapter 2, 11, it says that, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, verses 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach. Now, it is still in the same book where they are telling us that, as far as the issue of salvation is concerned, we are actually having the same status, male and female, in the body of Christ. Because the same person who died for the men is the same person that died for the women. Remember the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman had to crush the head of the serpent. Jesus is the seed of the woman, so the woman cannot be left out. So as far as our salvation is concerned, we are of the same status. There is no difference. We are all new creations. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. But when it comes to the issue of handling doctrine in the church, the Bible says that this responsibility was not given to the woman. Why? In the first place of it all in Genesis, the fall of of man made the woman to become more sensitive. However, it made the man to become insensitive. So the woman, the insensitivity of, of her husband for protection. So a woman has to be actually under what we call the protection of the man. That is why in the church order, leadership is male, not female. That is why Paul writes by saying, but I suffer not a woman to teach. Now teaching here is to do with what we call doctrine, didasco. So the authority of actually instructing or being a teacher of the word in the house of God, in a general congregation, it was not given to the woman, it was given to the man. So if we are the pillar and the ground of truth, we are supposed to defend this because there is this mushrooming of uh, self-appointed women preachers who believe that they have a message that men are not doing their part. Therefore, they are to replace, they are to fill in for the men. God is not looking for you to fill in. Stay where he wants you to be. So he says that, uh, but I suffer not the woman to teach, nor to usurp authority. First time she tried to usurp authority, you see what really happened. So they are so very much vulnerable to what we call spiritual seduction. They need to be under what we call a covering of their own husband. The same way the church is under the protective covering of Jesus Christ. He adds in to say, <coughs> to usurp the authority of the man, but to be in silence. Now silence here does not mean that she has nothing to offer. No, she can actually share her testimony. But what we call a prolonged speech 
that's one thing that the Bible forbids her from doing. A regular preacher in a mixed congregation of male and female. The Bible does not allow it. If she does it, the Bible calls it usurping the authority. And the reason for why Paul says what he says before he goes to chapter 3, where we're going to pay close attention, he says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Are you seeing? The order of creation is male and then female. So that is the same thing God uses for his church. Verses 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Those are main things that Paul built on his teaching. Now, someone might say again, now, don't women have any other thing that they can do? No, the Bible supports that women can do a number of different things. Remember in the Old Testament, actually starting from the Old Testament, where you see anything that is to do with maybe, let me just give you an example. Where you see like a, a Deborah, there is a Barak in the book of Judges. Where you see an, the Esther, there is actually Mordecai that is in the book of uh, of Esther. Uh, when you also consider the term of uh, to do with uh, when Jesus was born, there was uh, a prophetess known as Anna, but Simeon was also there. When you come into the term of uh, term of uh, the apostles, where you see Priscilla, there was also Aquila. That's the order, male and female, male and female, but the woman not actually topping it over. And now another thing that we can also consider is what we see in the book of Titus chapter 2 and the verse 3. It says, the aged women likewise, they be in behavior as becometh holy, uh, holiness, not false accusers, not given to to much wine, teachers of good things. Women can still do what we call teaching, but what is their audience? We, which kind of audience are we talking about? Verses 2. That they may teach the young women to be sober and to be lovers of their husbands and to love their children. Women can minister to fellow women. We commonly call it the women ministry. They can do that. They can lead Sunday school. They can teach their children. They can actually talk to a person one on one. But there are particular things as far as sharing what we call teaching in a mixed congregation. The scripture is completely against it. Now, don't pick up issues with me. Pick up issues with the scripture. You either obey the scripture or you obey some other thing. That is one thing that uh, I wanted also to show you. Now, going to the chapter where we are dwelling uh, this teaching on first timothy chapter 3 still it adds on on the issue of the woman where we are having the very close where we're having the very phrase of actually us being the pillar and the ground of truth paul repeats it by saying in chapter 3 verses 1 this is a true saying if a man desire to be in the office of the bishop and now look at that one. If a man desires to be in the office of the bishop, he desireth a good work. Now look at verses 2. A bishop then must. Now who is a bishop here? A bishop is an, an overseer. A man that is charged with the duty of seeing that things be done by others rightly and actually in accordance to what is supposed to be done. That means a bishop can also be pastor, can be a teacher, can be an elder. But now here I say, a bishop or a pastor then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. How is the church going to be the pillar and the ground of truth? What is already given? They are telling Timothy, these are some other things. He had to be very sure how, which kind of people is even appointing in offices. How is he exercising this? Is he aware of the people he's appointing? Those are some of the things they are warning him about. And as they were warning him, they were actually warning us. Timothy was instructed to make sure that he preserves the doctrine pure. He was instructed to defend it. He was instructed to transmit it to the future. The same way uh, we know it in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, where actually Apostle talks to him and says, whatever thing you have seen me do in the midst of so many people, please make sure that you also uh, extend it or give it to the faithful men. So he had to preserve it pure, to defend it, to transmit it to the future terms, and everything that was to do as far as the administration administrative affairs as far as picking who should do this and it he had to make sure that in one or the other he engages people in two different uh, responsibilities that are supposed to be in those particular responsibilities 
That's how they made it very clear. And that is why they are saying a bishop must be blameless, a husband of one wife. So now today what we are seeing is the opposite. The men have given their trousers to the women and the women have given their dresses to the men. That should do not do what should do not happen. They are not saying a woman of one husband. They are saying a husband of one wife. The same thing is repeated in the book of our Titus. Titus chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, they are repeating the same thing, the husband of one wife. The same is true still in First Timothy chapter 3 and verse is 5. They are saying to us, For if a man knoweth not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And what is the church of God? It is the pillar of underground of truth the pillar underground of truth there are things that are supposed to be followed there are things that are supposed to be upheld as far as the church is concerned and that is why there is a typical example we can actually consider as far as the, the church of philadelphia in the book of revelation that church teaches us a number of outstanding things that you and i can consider the Bible shows us when you look into the book of Galatians chapter 2. Let us consider something here in Galatians 2. And the verse is, uh, let me begin in verses 8. It says, For he that wrote effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentile. Verses 9. And when James, James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, the apostles here, the Bible says, they seem to be pillars. They were building blocks. They held things together. In one or the other, when they call them actually pillars, they were sustaining. They were doing an outstanding work of actually keeping and preserving what was being given. So that is why even Paul had to actually to go and meet with them. But the Bible says they were known as pillars. And one thing that we should not forget about that is uh, there is a church in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, and uh, starting with verses, uh, verses uh, 1, it says, Him that overcometh, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. Look at that one. Him that overcometh, overcoming how? We need to know some of the things. Overcoming how? This church had some challenges that, were, that had come through for it. But let me just give you something very simple here. As far as what he says about this church. Uh, when he was writing to it, he said something that... Uh, let me begin with verses 7. The angel, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the things saith he that is holy, he that is true. Remember... What we have realized from 1 Timothy 3 verses 15, the Bible talks about the church being the pillar and the ground of truth. Jesus presents himself to this church as the one that is true. He that has the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth. He that shutteth and no man does what opens. Verses 8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. To the faithful church, the Lord has set before us what we call an open door. And no man can shut it. As far as the defense of the gospel, we are supposed to do that. That is our open door for us. No one should come in, in one or the other, to convince us to follow any other thing other than what we are supposed to do as a faithful church where Jesus presents himself as the true one that has the key of David. The key represent, represents what? Authority and power. Authority and power. Remember that was the same key that was actually spoken or given unto, uh, unto Peter and the rest of the apostles in the book of Matthew chapter 16. If the scripture says that, that Peter I give unto you the key, never meant that the key was given to Peter alone just like the church of, of Rome claims. Peter was the first among the equals. So Peter was acting as what we call the corporate solidarity. He was representing a number of different individuals who actually are known as believers. That's something that is very important to be understood. He adds in to say, verses 8 in uh, Revelation 3, I know of your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. For you have little strength. 
Churches which are upholding what we call the sound doctrine, they might not have all the numbers as far as congregations is, is concerned. They might not have all the money. They might not have all that influence that other churches might be having. But something unique about them, even though they had the little strength, they kept what they knew that was very important. The little strength comes because of a number of oppositions. It is just like having a good church but in a very bad neighborhood. The same thing you see with this church here. It before you come to the book uh, to the to the church of Philadelphia, there is what we call the church of Sardis, which is commonly known as the dead church. And after the church of Philadelphia, there is a church that is known as the church of Laodicea, which is built on what we call many's opinions. Whatever actually comes to the mind of the minister is what is being done there. That is why there is a number of these things of I hear gold dusty, I hear slain in the spirit, I hear demon possessions. Many's opinion, the ministry of deliverance that is being carried out today, those are things which are non biblical. Why? The moment we are in Christ, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. These are all the things that the Bible makes very clear. First John 4, 4, uh, first John th uh, 4, 13. This is how we know that we are in him and he in us. So this church had little strength. It is a faithful church that is not going to go through the tribulation. However, it is going to have a number of different persecution coming through for it, for speaking the truth how it is. So he doesn't say, you have little strength and you have kept my word and you have not denied it. Now mark that one. You have kept my word. This church was so very much consumed. It was so much absorbed in holding on to what was given, in holding to what we call the teachings that were given. Now remember, these are Jesus' own episodes because there are seven churches and these are seven letters to these churches. So he says that you have kept my word. He opposes to Timothy that in, in chapter in chapter 3 verses 15 if I tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God which is the church of God the pillar and the ground of truth now here is something that makes the church of Philadelphia to be such an outstanding church it's not only that this church is a church that exercises what we call brotherly love but it is a church that has interest for the defense of the scriptures for the defense of the word of the Lord because as he represented himself to it he said that I am the true one the one that has the key of David the one that has the key of David. And you have little strength. But though you have the little strength, you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Independent of what you can be going through as a congregation that speaketh the, the, the truth. Doesn't matter how many you are. Doesn't matter how much you have. Doesn't matter how many programs you have. It doesn't matter who knows you and who doesn't know you. The Bible says your faithfulness is one thing that is more important. Can you continue to hold on to what is true? Look at verses 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. What are synagogues of Satan? The people that claim to be true Jews, yet they are not. The people claim other, other means to the Lord. And during the time of Christ, there were a number of different people that are known as the synagogue of, of Christ. Those are people who rejected Christ as the Messiah. And since they had rejected Christ as the Messiah, they began to persecute those that were faithing in him as the Messiah. Today we have it still. It happened in the church of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 2. The Bible talks to us about the false brethren who actually spy on our liberty. Remember, if they cannot refute what you are saying, they are going to attack you for saying it. Now, the false or what we call the synagogue of Satan are all those neighboring uh, movements, neighboring churches that are not upholding to the truth. Instead of being in support or to stand behind you, to encourage you, since for them they are so much taken up in uh, experiential theology, they are looking for the goddess, they are looking for the angelic visitation, they are looking for visions and dreams, they are looking for who is the best man around town, who has more cash, who has more following, they are going to be offended at you citing out things that are unbiblical. Those are what the Bible calls the synagogue of Satan. We already have a teaching on this. You can go on our YouTube. Understanding 
the difference between the synagogue of Christ and the, and the synagogue of Satan. Uh, all of these things, all of the religions that are unfit for human consumption, those are all we call what? Synagogues of Satan. Synagogues of Satan. Whether it is Jehovah's Witness, whether it is the Mammons, those are all the things which are actually unfit for human consumption. Jesus is the only Savior. John 14, 6 says that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. He is not a way. He is not a truth. He is not uh, a life. He is the definite article, the truth. He is the way, the truth, the life. That's very important. So he adds in to say, the synagogue of, of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. They pretend that they are true ministers of God, but they are in for money. They are in for building their own monuments. They are in for building their own names. That is why they are accepting worship. That is why they actually have a number of false prophecies. And one thing the Bible tells us that, that was very outstanding about the Church of Philadelphia, they kept the word of the Lord and they never denied him. Even when they were made irrelevant, they chose to remain irrelevant to the people around. But they kept the relevance of the scripture. They kept what we call the sufficiency of the scripture. Continues to say in Revelation 3 9. Behold, I will make of them to come and worship before your feet and, and to know that I have loved you. Verses uh, 10. Because you have kept my word. Look at that one. Because you have kept my word. Today, do we still have churches of Philadelphia? Because you have kept my word of my patience, in other words, perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The Bible says because of the faithfulness of a church that sees itself as the pillar and the ground of truth, the temptation that is going to come upon all the entire world, this temptation, few people will escape it. The ones who are not faithful, they will not escape it. But the Bible says he will keep them from that. This is the church that is not going, that is not going to go through the tribulation. As maybe the tribulation starts, this church will be taken out. But to the unfaithful church, they will actually have to go through it. Because they are already deceived. And I'm telling you one thing that is very important here. That we need to understand in verses 11. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which you have. Hold fast. Meaning that don't change if you are knowing that what you're doing is right. You're not adding to the doctrine. You're not subtracting. He says, continue holding on to it. Hold on to it which you have. That no man taketh your crown away. This is just like a young woman that is not yet married. Your virginity is your crown. The only time to give it up is when you're married. Even us, the faithfulness and everything the Lord has done in us, we are supposed to hold on to it until when we see him face to face, then we throw our crowns unto him and say, all the honor and the glory belongs to you. Verses 12. He say, him that overcometh, I will make a pillar. See that one. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. In the temple of my God. Now something here that needs to be understood in a few minutes I have. Just like Peter, James, John, there were pillars in Galatians chapter 2. You remember Galatians 2, 9 says that, And when James, Cephas, John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived of the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So the same way the Bible refers to them as pillars, something has to be understood here. If you don't understand this, you'll miss out on everything. Whoever holds to the apostolic teachings in refuting of errors will have the same stand as the apostles did. If God saw them as pillars, and this thing is given to us in the scriptures, whoever continues to uphold, to continue in the teachings of the apostles, not adding, not subtracting, not exalting yourself, but you remain a servant, that I opens others, that actually supports the ones who are doing the right thing. The Bible says, as they were referred to as pillars, we automatically, one thing that happens, that the more we continue to uphold to the teachings of those pillars that we have seen in the scriptures, we ourselves will be pillars in the temple of God. That basically means that the faithful church are the pillars right now. 
if we have a faithful church that is holding to the truth of the gospel, that is what we call actually the pillar that we are having right now. Remember, the apostles resisted all forms of errors and taught the truth in the first century when the devil actually was attacking the church from all directions. And that is the same thing that I am to say to us. Whoever continues to remain, whoever continues to be loyal to the teaching of the scriptures, that individual actually is in the same character of the apostles. Now, one thing I need you to understand, we are of the same rank, but we are not of the same status. We are of the same rank, but we are not of the same status. What do I mean by this? It is just like I remember playing football. We had what we call a captain in football, or there is what we call a captain. But if the captain is being substituted, he does not go with a bandage of a captain out. However, he can entrust it to someone else. That is the rank we are talking about, but not status. Why? These apostles were given an opportunity of writing. They were chosen of the Lord physically. They saw him when he was doing his uh, earthly ministry. They saw him after his resurrection, and they received a direct revelation from him as far as what we have as scriptures, which none of us cannot come close to. So we are not of the same status, but we are of the same rank. As long as we continue to refute errors, expose them, and hold on to what is already given. That's what we call upholding to the apostolic doctrine. So things to do with the people who are holding to the things of slain in the spirit. I hear ministers talk, talking about these funny things. We should avoid them completely. Where someone just waves his hand and people fall, the entire choir also falls the other side. That is not the spirit of God. That is actually the spirit of error. And if it's not the spirit of error, that church needs to be taught. If you are saying that you have been hit by the spirit of the Lord, why should you have professional catchers behind you? You hit the ground and then we know that the Lord is dealing with you. Another thing, I've talked about the, us avoiding the the tithe preachers, that is not for the New Testament. Why? Hebrews 7, 12 says that when the priesthood changes, there is also need or necessity for the change of the law. Jesus is our New Testament priest. Things to do with selling of uh, the anointing oils, we should avoid them. Things to do with selling, things like uh, the prayer cloth, we should avoid them. Messages that are to do with the positive word confession, that you can shape your destiny by your own words, that is not true. God alone is the creator. You cannot speak things into existence. God alone can. And another thing that we should also avoid ecumenism ministers joining different religions as their mandate that is not the work for us we are supposed to go and preach the gospel and make disciples another thing anything of teaching on things to do with the angelic activities in service where people are saying that uh, there is a lot of angelic activities all around them we should avoid those things people are saying that they are bathing something out what are you bathing are you a woman in a service Hey, the, the legs of T.D. Jakes do things are wrong. Things to do with Hillsong and uh, Jesus culture, things to do with uh, uh, Bill jo Johnson. We should avoid their, their doctrine, things to do with the uh, grave soaking and things to do with the uh, talking about things to do with the gold dust in their services. They continue to, to ask money from their church. And then another thing is uh, divorces in the church, which are not on, uh, on biblical grounds. Why? People who have divorced their women actually off the biblical grounds, they are the same people who are standing on the pulpits today. If there is any separation between a husband and wife in a Christian marriage, there should be room for reconciliation. God is not in support of divorce. And some even their women are not dead and the men are not dead, but they are actually in the flesh. They reign after another one. You see, all of those things, heavy shepherding, what I say goes in my church. Even when you're teaching error and people try to correct you and you say, this is my church. If you cannot obey what that I'm teaching under the anointing, better for you leave. Which anointing, which yet you're stealing from people, you're not showing them the truth. You bring in Nigerians all over. You bring in Koreans and what, whatsoever kind of people. The Bible does not support that. The new apostolic reformation, we should avoid it. People who think that they're in the same caliber with the apostles, that they can do the same signs and wonders. The lies of the Bushil is that he, he can walk in air. These are all wrong stuff. The, the, the recent exposure of Alpha Lokao saying that he can resurrect a person. Those are groups of individuals we should avoid. And there are so many in Uganda here. And I'm here to mention your pastor. I'm here to mention your minister. False prophets and false teachers, we should avoid those individuals. Why? Because... Those are things that we are not supposed to be a part of. Why are we not supposed to be a part of? If we are 
the pillar of truth. Remember one thing the Bible makes very clear in our first Timothy chapter 3.16 it says and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God manifested in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached unto Gentiles believed on him and was received up on glory so the mystery of godliness talks about Christ being the only way the truth and the life no one should change that. That's why John 1, 4, uh, 17 says that for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The church is the pillar and the ground of truth. As a matter of fact, Christ is the only way, the truth and the life. More to that, he said one thing to Pilate. Pilate said, who are you? He said, Pilate therefore said unto him, are you the king then? Jesus say, answered, you have answered, I am a king. And to this end I was born for this cause. Came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. And to the truth, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Do you belong to Christ? If you belong to Christ, these are some of the things you should not take for granted. Remember what happened to the church of the Galatians. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ ha has been crucified, evidently set forth and crucified among you. They told them, why are you not obeying the truth? There are a number of different things, but time cannot allow me to go beyond this point. But if you know you are caught actually in deception, please come out of deception. Receive the gospel. Give us a call. Uh, let us actually know how we can help you. And for all of you that have read the called in in appreciation of what we are doing, want to appreciate you so much. And people who have made up your mind in one way or the other, you want to support us. Thank you so much. For those that are not yet in Christ, the simple message is today or now is the time of your salvation. Believe the gospel, that is the death, burial, and the resurrection, and you shall be saved. You're blessed with blessing. Shalom. And you listen to me. Any doctrine. 99.9% .9 of people are not bad people. Any principle. The more you give to me, the more I give back to you. Any law. And say, you see, God, I have got my receipt from my sowing, and now I have a need, and I'm cashing in my receipt. Any teaching. It's always been in you. It's always been in you. That is placed beside the gospel. Whatever you do right now, don't you stop tithing. Are given more emphasis than the gospel. Make the vow now and then obey the Lord and sow that seed. And watch what God will do with you. I want to hear about your miracle. No matter how harmless it may be in itself, immediately turns into a doctrine of demons.